Gentlemen, who'd like to start the ball rolling? Take a mic. I, I thought we were going to be asked questions. I haven't thought about this for a second. <laughs> and the, the, the talks that you heard I, today? I, I, I need a little bit more time. <laughs> Does anybody have a question that you would like to ask? Yes, there's questions on left and right. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm Amos Kolchin from Tel Aviv. And I have uh, a remark to say about uh, the issue of visual experience and visual signs. And, I say, and what I want to say is that now that we've heard all this, I'm still left with a hard question, which is how, do, do, uh, or how can we tell whether my experience of redness and anybody else's experience of redness is the same or not? And until we've solved that problem, which I think is maybe unsolvable, we have not been able to really understand uh, the, uh, the issue. I really didn't mean to be aggressive, not actually implicitly. Um, I, I think that one picture of, of visual experience is that the usual picture is that it's some kind of froth whipped up by a lot of neural activity um, internal to the head and uh, uh, whether the froth that's whipped up in me is the same or different to the froth that's whipped up in you, that's the thing that is completely unknowable. That's the perspective on which visual experience seems like a deep mystery that we'll never get to the bottom of. I, I really meant to be suggesting an alternative to that picture, which is that we think of the common sense world, the high level, uh, medium sized world, as out there with all its colors and shapes and so on, all the people independently of each of us. And to think of visual experience as a relation to that. So that the question whether you're having the same color experience as I am is typically answered by asking, are you visually related to the same colors out there in the environment as I am? Now, I think that's not the perspective that people usually have when they're doing philosophy or thinking theoretically about these things. I think that it's absolutely the perspective of unreflective common sense or anyone working in the visual arts. I mean, if you think, for example, of um, Picasso or uh, Batiste or Jackson Pollock um, painting something and saying, now, shall I... <laughs> Well, perhaps this is a simplification of what a great painter thinks, but suppose you have someone thinking, well, shall I put a bit more red in the top left-hand corner? Is it well balanced? Now, when you're doing that, when you're doing something in the visual arts, you don't for a moment think, well, of course, what's going on in anyone else's mind when you look at this thing? It's completely unfathomable. It's a complete mystery to me what goes on in someone else's mind when they look at the, at the colors in this painting. You take it absolutely for granted that you're doing something objective to the colors in the painting when you slap on a bit more here or there and that you know exactly what difference that's going to make someone's visual experience to you. I think that's the perspective that we have when we're not theorizing about experience and when we're not in the middle of some philosophy or cognitive science thinking about visual experience. And that's the perspective I was recommending. From that perspective, there really is no deep puzzle about the inverted spectrum. Can, can I add to that? Sure. So here, here maybe, uh, maybe a physics uh, angle on, on a related issue. I think it's related. Uh, I think it's held now that electrons are indistinguishable from one another. In fact, I think it was John Archibald Wheeler, who I think maybe or Feynman, who wrote half-jokingly that it may all be just one, one electron just being very, very quickly in many different places. <laughs> How do we know that? It's the same kind of question. I mean, it's kind of, you know, that's what falls out of the math, essentially, I guess, as, as far as I, I'm not a physicist, as far as I understand that. And at, on some level, which actually is a pretty fundamental level, we just have to put up with that. that. That's how our understanding of the universe works, through mathematics and through consistency, as, as I kind of hinted in my talk. And I think pr insisting that there are deeper mysteries there just creates mysteries out of nothing that don't, that don't exist. And I want to add another angle. I think it's a story about uh, Lao Zi, the, the old man, the, the old philosopher in, in China, was walking with a friend uh, along a canal. 
uh, and then they came to a pond and there were some fish jumping in the pond and Lao Tzu said, look, look at those happy fish. And his friend said, uh, well, how, how do you know? How, you're not a fish. How can you know if they're happy or not? And Lao Tzu said, well, how do you know I don't? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, so I think, uh, Shimon, that uh, when, when you and I uh, see a beautiful woman, uh, we may see the same thing, and yet our reaction, our mental reaction, may be completely different. Of course, it could. I, I could be gay, I'm not, but I could, so, you know. Uh, so, I have another question. <laughs> I have, another, I have a question to uh, David Friedman, uh, which uh, maybe I'm sure you have not studied, but uh, let's speculate. At what stage do you think the, the experimental animal, let it be a macaque or, or a human, in, uh, understands the rule of the game? And would, it, would they understand, if, I, if you would do the same study on me, would I, understand, would I be able to formulate w what is the answer before I make the correct responses or sometime after I've already made the correct responses? I think that this is the issue really of where the consciousness comes into play because I think without knowing the facts, I, I would guess that the correct responses will antedate the time at which I could formulate it. So therefore, the consciousness is, is, does not come ahead of time. It follows the, un, our understanding. I think that this is an, an, a really important uh, point, and that's why I bring it up. So, and really the question is, what do we mean by consciousness? And this comes throughout these lectures today, that there are many levels of consciousness, we all agree. But to go and to, to use the same term for everything may be misleading. So to say that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> the, the macaque has the same consciousness that, uh, that, we, that we have or that uh, the dog has the same uh, consciousness and same thing on a, on a lower level and even the camera may have a consciousness because it reacts, because it, it can focus on a face. So obviously it recognizes the face and responds to this the logic is, is beyond me because you could also say that if I throw a stone and the stone comes down back to the earth, it knows that it should go be there because that's its normal place. There's the same logic for me. And of course we say this is, uh, I, I could not say that the stone has a mind, um, so, uh, so why not? Why not? It, because I know that it, it follows physical laws when it falls back to the ground. And so does the camera, and so does the aplysia. And so for us to say that uh, a stone or, a, or an aplysia or a dog or even you have a mind does not make sense because I don't know. I only know of my own consciousness, consciousness, and I don't know about anybody else. So we cannot, this question cannot be answered. There, there, are, there are cultures which believe that the trees and water, flowing water, and, and, uh, and stones have personalities, have uh, some sort of consciousness of their own, and, and scientifically, we cannot disprove it. So if we cannot disprove it, that's not a scientific question. So we cannot, it's not a scientific question to ask whether the aplysia has a consciousness or not. This was a statement. Anybody? <laughs> And as, I guess as I, as, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, uh, you know, my interest in, in these questions about decision making and categorization were initially, initially came from just initial enthusiasm in, you know, can we get a mechanistic under, understanding of the, you know, mechanisms underlying, uh, underlying conscious experience. And I, you know, as I, and I was a naive undergraduate and, uh, you know, did as much reading as I could and became frustrated. I, I think I have a, a, a mechanistic and maybe a reductionist tendency myself. So I, I, I tried to identify the, uh, a question that was 
tractable and testable experimentally that I thought might might lead somehow lead us a little bit closer to the goal of, of understanding some of these uh, you know more philosophical questions but um, so that's I mean that's sort of the, the the motivation but behind the work that's how we found ourselves studying you know at this stage, I think it's easier to study some of the uh, mechanisms underlying cognitive representation because we're at a very early stage of, 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 studying, of studying this process, right? So, I mean, the questions now, I mean, the questions are as simple as can we identify which areas of the visual system are more correlated with the animal's uh, decision-making processes, right? We're, we're, we're focused on identifying regions of the brain that are relevant for these processes. Right, and that's going to, that's going to be easier than, than really identifying the actual circuit mechanisms the brain uses. So I think that the bigger challenge lies ahead for us. So. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Gardhaus. I'm from uh, University of Luxembourg. Uh, this question is mainly for Dr. Edelman. I, I. Basically, the question is: Is oh, first off, is it okay if I call seeing as kind of like phenomenality for for what your usage of the words? Seeing as. Seeing as, not just seeing. Actually, seeing as is is categorization or classification. I think it's it's a very limited kind of phenomenality. Okay, so you, you would rather they were kept apart. Well, you can call it what you want, but you know. Okay, no, I, uh, <laughs> then I will call them the same thing for right now. Uh, but mainly, seeing as is seeing as the result, or, or were you? in some sense saying that seeing as seeing as is the result of semi-periodicity. Uh, and I'll explain. That, uh, that is an, an intermixture of repetition and difference in, that, um, in, in complexity theory and information uh, creation. There's the ideas that uh, so information is formed only at the juncture of repetition and difference. If you have a series that's just one, 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 less and less information is given every time a one occurs again. Uh, but you can't ever know that the next one will be a one. You eventually just have a strong belief that it will be, uh, you know, Hume and that kind of idea. Uh, but if you have a series that's one, four, six, one, six, four, three, two, it's you know, fairly randomized or ideally fully randomized, we get 100% new information in every number. It's completely un undetermined or you can't predict it. But you have no faith in your future predictions because you have a random set that you can't make a prediction about. Um, when we have, so, so on the one side, we have faith, belief that we, we have one, 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 we might be able to continue to predict because we have a series of uh, repetitions. On the other hand, we have skepticism. We have a complete like lack of uh, trust in our ability to guess. Is, is there a sense that you might say uh, that phenomenal, seeing as is a juncture sort of, or of faith and belief, where you, or sorry, faith and skepticism, where on one side you feel a certain amount of faith in, uh, in your situation, but you still have a certain amount of doubt. And at this point, there's a sort of mm, an ability to begin categorizing uh, in that sense or phenomenalizing. This, well, this is sort of Bergsonian. I don't know if you've read much of him, but just to give you a well, sense of where I'm coming from. Yeah, it's a tough question, I think, uh, but I'll, I'll try my hand at it nevertheless. Uh, I think Warren McCulloch uh, once wrote something along the lines that uh, the, the horses of experience uh, never drag, never quite succeed to drag uh, the cart of the mind to certainty, only to probability. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, so I, I don't really, with regard to that, I, I, I wouldn't want to commit to even using the you know, certainty in, in any kind of formal way. I mean, one, one can quantify probabilities. In fact, uh, on uh, Wednesday, I think, there will be a talk. Bjorn Merker will talk about uh, his ideas of how the uh, reduction in uncertainty corresponds, in, in his view, to, to phenomenality somehow. So uh, I, I, I think there is part of some kind of truth in that, but, but not it, it doesn't quite close the issue. And I also want to, to comment on, on the, in general, the, so this is probability, this probabilistic take. I mean, I, I should say, I should have said, I think 
all of cognition is probabilistic. Yeah. Bayes was there, it was grayed out, but it was, it was there. And you know, neurons do Bayes, and in, even neurons in aplysia, that the aplysia scientists think don't do Bayes, they also do Bayes. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, information theory, on the other hand, it, one has to be careful about applying information theory to, to, to uh, living domains because evolution has this knack for um, opening up what you thought was a closed domain, which is the only kind of domain in which you can define information at all. In fact, probability as well is problematic a bit in that respect. And so when you have speciation, for instance, uh, you know the description space of the system all of a sudden sprouts a bunch of new dimensions. What happens to the, the information, the amount of information in the system? Get, some gets generated out of nothing, seemingly. Uh, probabilities get screwed up, screwed over. So one is safer, I think, uh, working with likelihoods, not likelihood ratios, not probabilities. So it, it's a royal mess. So I, I, I want to commit, and I am, I am committed to, to the use of some of the tools of, of Bayesian inference, and specifically uh, non-parametric Bayesian learning and inference in uh, these domains we are discussing. But one has to be careful with, I, I mean, I want to be careful with identifying, saying, seeing as is exactly that in probabilistic terms. I think I know what it is, what it boils down to in, in dynamical systems terms. What it boils down to in probabilistic terms, I'm, I'm not quite sure I want to commit to. Okay, okay. Okay, fair enough. I will, I, I'll just say, I, I didn't mean a closed system ever. I don't mean information well, in that. You, you can well, when do you have a closed system? I don't think information. If it's an there. open system, I mean, if, 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 if the, if the uh, the set over which um, strings are defined is not closed. How can you speak about you know information, the amount of information? Well, do do a semi-periodicity. That's exactly my point. That you can be unpredictable in a certain sense, but at the same time have a semi-stability semi within that closed open system. At, at any point, it could get knocked off to a new attractor. I, I certainly didn't mean to close the system. Is all I'm saying. And uh, let, let, I think that's. Let's important. talk about this later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Hi, uh, Laurence Dumont from the University of Montréal. My question is to Dr. Haggard. I'd like to um, know about inter intentional fluency. He said it comes with uh, learning and feedback from judgments of agency. I'd like to know how you relate this concept to habits, since habits are, are not really related to agency. Okay, so I think you probably get an intentional fluency signal all the time. So when you, when you solve the problem of what do I do now, what do I do next, when you solve that problem um, under conflict, you have a disfluency signal, this competition. When you solve that problem readily and easily, either because the competition is strongly biased or because there's only a small possible response space, then you have intentional fluency. So intentional fluency is is not itself directly relevant to control because intentional fluency is about how you decide what you're going to do, how readily you decide what you're going to do. In fact, you might do something which is completely wrong and which doesn't achieve the result that you expect. So um, you need quite a lot of learning, I think, in order for uh, the ease with which you decide what to do to really be a useful correlate of how well your action is actually going to succeed. So that's one way of just defining expertise, of being an expert agent, if you like, is that you see the heart of the problem, you know what to do next, and then the actual doing of it is straightforward because it's just, you're, you're going to execute it and you know it's going to have the desired result. So therefore, you, the point about all these sort of metacognitive frontal signals is that, that they, uh, that they'll only really be useful proxies for things like agency if you're already a good agent, if you've already learned, uh, there's quite a lot of in successful instrumental learning which has gone before. Now, um, I think I'd be a little bit reluctant to talk about habits. I would say it's more to do with instrumental learning than, 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 than with habits. And I think probably I don't need to talk about habits in order to explain how um, such a signal might actually be a useful proxy for agency. So I haven't thought a lot about habit, okay. and uh, I'd rather pass on that part of the question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Pauline, uh, Bioanthropology, University of Montreal. 
Uh, the title of this uh, summer school is Evolution and Function of Consciousness, so let's talk about evolution and function. Uh, some, some of you talked about uh, cate uh, categorization, so uh, do you think that, uh, this is a question for the whole panel, not only for people who talked about categorization, uh, do you think that uh, cate categorization um, has an adaptive function, and if you do, and I hope you do, uh, <laughs> uh, to which extent do you think that um, consciousness, uh, that uh, adaptive function of cat categorization relies on consciousness? I mean, to which e extent do you think consciousness as something um, uh, has something to do with the, uh, the helps in the adaptive functions of um, cate cate categorization and especially in humans. Well, I guess I would say that uh, the categorization, at least the way that we think about it and study it in the laboratory, um, d depends critically on plasticity. So we really think about the category representations uh, that, that we're, uh, we're examining as, as likely resulting from uh, flexibility in the readout of sensory information from early sensory processing areas of the brain. And this gives animals, flexi uh, gives animals flexibility in that they can recognize the behavioral significance of a stimulus, which, and that behavioral significance was determined through you know, uh, prior experience. And so this gives the animals flexibility in, uh, in, in their behavior, both in the, the long term, adapting to, uh, adapting to stimuli, recognizing their significance, and also uh, learning higher level conceptual representations or rule-like representations, which can allow an animal to flexibly uh, adapt their behavior in, in a shorter time scale, right, within a, a single behavioral session. So. To relate, I, I, maybe I can uh, can let some of you uh, speculate on the relationship between this and consciousness. Um, I, I don't have a speculation, but I do have a question. Another um, advantage of a categorization system is it provides considerable cognitive efficiency, because rather than having lots and lots of codes for every individual item, you can code a large number of items uh, by giving them a weighting according to which categories they fall into. So there's a clear cognitive economy. Now, I can't see any reason why that, that process of economical coding should have anything to do with consciousness. So I suppose I like the idea that you answered in terms of plasticity, because that seems to perhaps fit better with the C word than um, economy. Can you comment? I don't know. I, mean, I, I would basically agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. So, so it's not about efficiency then. That would be the answer. Okay. But do you do you see any? Uh, do you think that consciousness uh, improve the the adaptive function of cate categorization? How about another quote from William James? <laughs> um, there was this observation about an animal. I think uh, this was paraphrased by people who came after because it couldn't have been that James referred to a washing machine uh, in his writings. But uh, the paraphrase goes something like, uh, uh, anyone who can ever, whoever, whoever observed an aging cat contemplating a jump onto a washing machine knows that uh, consciousness become, becomes particularly acute at the moment of an important decision. <laughs> so I think that's, that's a tie between decision making, categorization, which is a kind of decision making, and, and consciousness. And uh, if you're an aging cat, um, you probably don't want to undertake a jump onto a washing machine in an unconscious state for obvious reasons. Afraid of snakes without having to learn it as pre programmed into your brain, that those things that look like that are bad for you, 
and you react a certain way. And there are a bunch of things that are pre-programmed to animals that are bad, avoid, don't do things. So the ability of consciousness would have to be for flexibility. It would have to be for flexibility to learn new things that you weren't previously out there in the world and be able to determine what to do with them. So I would say certainly categorization is a natural important thing so that you have know what how to respond to a stimulus. Be able to respond to new stimuli or to be adaptive in your response might now require a higher level of complexity. But categorization itself is just the ability of the nervous system to parse incoming inputs into a into a decision and often as fast as possible. So I would say that you don't need consciousness for categorization. The categorization is an important brain function independent of consciousness, but probably for this evolution for the plasticity of it and for great flexibility, then you might need to have some consciousness. I just want to add another dimension that we haven't really talked about today. Um, it's arguable that consciousness has something to do with the possibility of empathy. I mean, so one reason why amplysia, you might think, that don't seem conscious is, is, how to, is how to get in there and uh, see things from the amplysia's point of view. Um, and uh, it may be that w one reason why uh, consciousness matters for, uh, uh, in connection with categorization is not so much for the categorization itself as for the possibility of an understanding of each other's categorizations, the possibility of getting into someone else's head and seeing how they are, how they are seeing the situation, which will matter for um, joint activity, joint attention, and so on. So should it be a kind of adaptive function for consciousness? Yeah, I'm saying if, if, if consciousness, if you thought of consciousness as what makes empathy possible, and an empathic understanding in turn is what makes all kinds of joint activities possible, um, then that could be adaptive. Thank you. Uh, I'm Felix, University in Montreal. I would just like to pursue on the uh, previous idea of the relationship between uh, habit uh, fluence, intentional fluency and, uh, and agency. So I, I just thought that uh, the difference between uh, habit and uh, intentional fluency could be the object of agency. Uh, in the case of habit, I think uh, the lowest is the habit. The lowest you feel uh, you have you have feeling of agency on uh, on uh, the decision you make because. Uh, can we have an example? Yeah, can we I have was, an example of a habitual behavior that we're actually talking? Yeah, about? if yes, you have, let's, let's think of, of specific if something example. becomes like automatic and you are uh, habituated, if, for instance, you uh, you hunt an animal and you are really an expert in that. Uh, you you you, um, you don't have to think before before pressing the the button to kill the animal. But if you're not an expert, you have to think of when you're gonna choose the right moment to kill the animal. When you're gonna am I am I pressing the button or not? And when you finally decide to to click, you feel really an agent on the decision because you were thinking about it for a while, and you really feel that that you could have done the decision as well as you could have not done the decision. So the only difference is yourself that done the that decided. It's just a feeling. But, uh, and uh, I think that uh, the, dif the difference in the case of uh, intentional fluency is that the, ob the object of agency is not, uh, is not uh, the decision, but is uh, the consequence. You feel that you have uh, your agent on the consequence because uh, uh, you were really um, uh, expert on doing the, the, the consequence you wanted. Okay, I think I can unpack the question now a bit more. So, um, the, the easiest way to define agency and control is a relationship between what I do and what happens. So, if I press the button, then the lights go on. So, you need to have some uh, idea of an external consequence of your action. So, I think about agency as a bit like instrumentality. It's the capacity that we have to change our environment or to change the world, right? So we can make the lights go on, we can make things happen. Mm -hmm. That's a fairly standard definition following on from the de definition of instrumental learning in animals. Now, you were saying that maybe you could feel that you're an agent over the decision. Yeah. But right? So that's, that's perhaps also possible, but that seems to me something 
um, rather different and rather special and rather abstract. So that, yeah. you can't imagine the rat in the cage experiencing agency over its own decisions, no. whereas one can imagine the rat in the cage experiencing agency over the food that it gets when it presses the button. And in fact, that's what instrumental learning is. I don't know about rats. I'm talking about humans. Right. I think everybody can feel. Uh, Mark Balagher, which we'll talk uh, in two days or something like that, I don't know, talks about torn decision, the moments when you don't know what outcomes, uh, what decision you will do, but you feel that you really are the agent of the decision because there would, could be any decision you could do. Okay. So when you choose, it was not determined. Okay, so, so, so that, that I think is, is more about something like reflective thought. Yeah. So what you call agency of a decision is more about the kind of deliberation that we go through where we think, well, where should we go for dinner? Chinese, Indian, Italian, mm -hmm. let's think about it, let's consider the advantages and the disadvantages of each, and then let's come up with, or let me come up with my own decision. Yeah. Now, to my mind, first of all, that capacity is dramatically overestimated. So people are really not very good at deliberative thought in the first place. <laughs> Secondly, one of, the, one of the standard ways that one would like to think about deliberative and reflective thought is of uh, an inter a, a weighing of different alternative action possibilities, right? So should, these are the advantages of the Chinese restaurant, these are the advantages of the Italian restaurant, let me think them through. Okay. So that's a situation where you're going to have conflict. You're going to have conflicting alternatives, and you have to come up with the best possible decision. When we started these experiments, um, one of the reasons why we started them we, was we were interested in whether people would feel a strong sense of agency when they were under conditions of conflict. So does our feeling of being the agent, of being in control of our lives, does it come from the ability to resolve conflict and to master difficult situations? And that's why we did incompatible and compatible priming, because incompatible priming is a very nice low-level example of conflict. Because in incompatible priming, you can put a person into conflict by giving them first a subliminal arrow, which they don't see, which suggests that they're going to go left, and then a superliminal arrow, which they do see, which tells them to go right. So it becomes rather tricky to go right in that situation because you're in a condition of conflict. You can see that it's tricky because your reaction time goes way up. Now, our original, or one of the original hypotheses had been that you know, maybe there's something about the will and this sort of exertion of the will, a kind of a Schopenhauer view that you feel a strong sense of agency when you, you sort of conquer all of this competing noise in the outside world and you exert your will and you go right even though there's all this stuff making you go left. That would be a situation where agency should be, should be directly proportional to conflict. Mm -hmm. But our results in several experiments show exactly the opposite, that you feel a strong sense of control when it's easy, when it's fluent, when there's no conflict, when you know what to do. But now, I think, I think that may be a little yeah. bit close to what you're meaning by habitual action or automatic action. Mm -hmm. So I'm, not, I'm sure that conflict is important in some things, but I think the, the sort of the, the grappling with different alternatives do, does not seem to me to be very relevant to the sense of control. Okay. Thank you. We can talk later. Hi. <coughs> Uh, this is a very broad question. Uh, feel free to diverge uh, to any subject that you feel is pertinent. If we were to design a test to uh, rate consciousness across species, but uh, more importantly for me, uh, for artificial beings, what do you think the components of such a test would be? And, uh, uh, and please stay away from the Turing test, s simply because this, this test has already been uh, defined. So just if we were to design a new test. Thank you. <laughs> In two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can be brief. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah. I, I, I know I think, it's a very wide question. I think maybe this is a good one right here, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> no, no this, this is the social stress test. <laughs> so if you, if you ever go, I, I, I don't, you know, um, uh, wish you that you would experience that. If you go under anesthesia, your doctor would have to decide when you're under. So uh, I don't know why you say, uh, singled out aliens. Did, did you single out aliens as? as, as oh yeah, no, you can go. That, you can go for I mean, aliens. Humans. Yeah. I mean, you 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 are for, just just as Amos noted earlier. You are as alien to me from the outside as you know, like the next alien would be to you or something like that. So it's a very concrete thing. It, it, it's it's an important issue, and and uh, and believe me, they don't do a Turing test on patients who are going under. I mean, they, they ask them to count backwards, but basically that's that's the crude thing. I mean, they are now trying, as far as I understand, to to progress towards more quantitative um, 
measurements of all kinds of physiological data. By the way, one remark here, um, if you ask what's, you know, I, I, I propose that it, it has to be phenomenology, ph phenomenality has to be uh, smeared over time, and one can ask immediately if it's not an instant of time, how long, how long does it take? Um, so the window of time seems to be two, about 200 milliseconds, which is what comes out, which is what, what I think the, the anesthesiologists believe to be uh, a period that if you go shorter than that, you really cannot be sure that, that the creature under the knife who's going to, to go under the knife is uh, awake or not. So, uh, my, so my, my suggestion would be get as many physiological measurements as possible, as many of those as possible from the brain. Um, and you know, the first step at this would be, and I, I don't know if they actually engage in that, but throw your best machine learning tools on that data space and see what comes out. Nothing mysterious there. Sorry, can I come back on that? There's an interesting debate going on, which I'm sure you know, about um, patients in reduced levels of consciousness and the extent to which you can uh, really interpret what level of consciousness they have based on their brain activity. And one criticism which has been made of that work is that inferences are made about the consciousness of individuals based on very, very limited behavioral repertoires. So uh, a very low bandwidth. So think about tennis, for example. Um, and th th the argument would be that in, in, those, in those studies, we're really using several orders of magnitude less physiological evidence to infer that somebody is conscious relative to the behavioral evidence that we expect of people every day, even when we go into a shop to buy a newspaper from them. Just to strengthen that, there's a lot of corticocentrism, and, and I, I admire the work of Bjorn Merker, whom I mentioned earlier, in, in uh, pushing the, the insight that it's subcortical structures that uh, sometimes can even suffice, specifically the midbrain structure, the superior colliculus, and have a look at his 2007 paper in BBS. <laughs> you know, I don't think that we have anything better than the Tory test right now for, for what you want to know. Yeah, we all, have to, we all have to be claim and proclaim and uh, adhere to limitations that we impose on ourselves. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, I had uh, some, a comment concerning categorization, but going with this question of a test for consciousness, uh, there's a test that... Uh, Carl Prebram talked about using uh, for quite a few years, and it goes back, it connects to one of the examples that Dennett actually gave on Friday. He called it the cuddliness test. He said animals that were cute and cuddly, he was willing to admit were conscious, and other animals he didn't know about. Uh, so there's another possibility. Uh, but no, the comment on uh, categorization has to do with this distinction that was made between just seeing and seeing as, because it seems to me that there's a balance between those two. Uh, seeing as, if, I, if I'm seeing as all the time, then I'm putting myself into a very restricted condition. For example, if I'm trying to move something heavy through a doorway and I don't have anything to prop the doorway open, and there's a big, heavy dictionary sitting over on a shelf, and I see it as a dictionary, then I have, have no thought that, oh, that I could use it as a doorstop. Uh, so perhaps there's some kind of trade-off in terms of just action and volition in terms of do I see things or do I see them as something? Uh, and I think people can often get trapped into seeing things as something when, in fact, it would be more effective in terms of maybe a creative response to just see something. Yeah, that, that, that's what the moth uh, that, that, that uh, tried to look like a wasp was doing. That's exactly that. I think you got it exactly right. Okay. Uh, my name is Etienne Zvinel from University of Montreal. My question is for Professor Friedman. 
Um, you talked about how uh, P the PFC structure and the LIP structure uh, represented information in a more kind of abstract binary categorical way, uh, while um, the IGC represented information in more kind of continuous way. So uh, do you think that uh, integrating these informations might be might permit to explain one of the characteristic results from categorical perception, which is an increase in the similarity between between category stimuli, which is which which we build, we feel actually that is more uh, distant than it is in reality, but relative to within category stimuli. So, do you think that integrating these both these information might explain that result? Yeah, so one thing to keep in mind is that the experiments that were done in uh, inferior temporal cortex and parietal cortex were using slightly different tasks, right? One was using shape stimuli, the other motion. But if we just consider the shape categorization right. uh, experiments for now, looking at inferior temporal cortex and prefrontal cortex, it's true that in prefrontal cortex we found, we saw very um, kind of binary-like responses that, that mirrored what the animals had been trained um, <laughs> trained to learn about these stimuli. Right. Whereas in inferior temporal cortex, there was much more influence of, or much more sensitivity to differences in, in visual features. But inferior temporal cortex did show, uh, there was evidence that IT cortex did show changes in those shape representations with experience. In, in particular, what we saw were, uh, was in increasingly sharp representations right at the boundary. Okay. So neurons tended to show a, a greater discrimination between stimuli if they were in different categories. But those same neurons did not generalize within a category. Right. So, but in, in you know across the population, uh, it was a, a quite a significant right. effect. But so, so this would potentially explain the an increased amount of discrimination you would yeah. see, you know, around category. And boundaries. it's also consistent with the fact that we don't observe a compression within the category, given that uh, the only information that is added is binary. So all you can do is is I mean. Uh, Increase the similarity between categories, but in no means it can compress. So to be consistent with this result, also. Yeah. So perceptually, are there's a, there's reason to think the animals can still discriminate between stimuli within the same category. Right. It's not that they can't perceptually discriminate between them. They have just learned to apply a abstract rule to right. basically ignore the differences in order to correctly respond. So it's right. a maybe it's more appropriate to think about that particular category scheme as a higher level rule-based category rather than a strictly a perceptual category in some sense. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Malcolm McIver at uh, Northwestern University. So my question is for uh, Patrick Haggard. Um, you, you, at the end of your talk, you uh, speculated what the causal role of, of your findings were, um, particular what, what role does agency play? And it, and it sounds like you're suggesting it's the solution to a, a credit assignment problem, essentially, with action, that you want to have a sense of responsibility over those actions that you have high fluency uh, a response to, because then that means you, you're the one who was the causal agent of it rather than something else. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting idea, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, uh, first, first of all, whether you've, you've, you've tried to see if, for example, in your intervention case with uh, magnetic stimulation, or uh, where, where you put the coil um, over the uh, posterior part of the, the brain where you're getting this, this um, signal, uh, that whether in those cases uh, you've seen any changes in the ability to learn, um, or if you've done any learning studies in those cases where you interrupt uh, the, the credit assignment. And secondly, there's this really interesting literature in uh, mazes, uh, rats solving mazes, where you see this uh, vicarious trial and uh, uh, vicar vicarious um, um, sort of experiential thing where they look down either side of a maze and their place cells for distal parts of the maze will light up and they do that early in conditioning and at the end they go into this habit mode where they just turn left and right without doing that. So it sort of fits very nicely with your, your, your mechanistic uh, model here. Um, okay, thank you very much for that great question. Um, I don't have any very definitive answers to what you suggested. So one of the features about human 
um, instrumental learning in the way that one studies it here is it's really, really good. So with simple uh, manual uh, choices where you're learning, for example, relations between a small number of actions and a small number of consequences, people learn that pretty quickly. And you can make it harder to learn by making it somewhat stochastic. But if you just have the, the kinds of simple uh, relations that we're looking at, um, it's quite difficult to study the learning process simply because it's so quick. Um, so just to give you an example, which comes from a slightly different field of work from what I was talking about earlier on this morning. Uh, there's a, if you make an action and it produces a consequence a few hundred milliseconds later, people perceive that action and the subsequent effect to occur closer in time than, they, than uh, control events which are not linked by I press the button, I cause mm -hmm. the beep, for example. So we call that phenomenon intentional binding because it seems to be a binding across time which is dependent on making an intentional action which causes the effect. And it, it's a pretty robust, reliable, perhaps implicit marker of, of being in control of, of the, the beep or whatever it is that you're causing. And people learn it remarkably quickly. So it's clear that it's learned because if, for example, you, you give people 40 trials where they're pressing a button and it's producing a beep 250 milliseconds later, and then on the 41st trial, completely unpredictably to the participant, you change that interval between action and beep from 250 to let's say 150, and you ask people, where was the position on the clock, this is one of these Libet type experiments, mm -hmm. when you heard the beep? They will tell you when they would have heard the beep given the interval that they had learned between their own action and beeps on the previous 40 trials, mm -hmm. and not about when the beep actually would occur, actually did occur. So that's clear that they're learning the relation between action and effect. But within a couple of trials at the new delay interval, their perception has adjusted to, you know, closer to what, what the actual action-effect relation is. So there clearly is a, 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 a learning about action-effect relations which seems to be relevant to, to credit assignment, as you put it, which is probably just, well, agency assignment might be another way of putting it. Um, but it's remarkably fast, so it, I, I, I think it's quite difficult in these kinds of studies to slow it down enough to really comment on the mechanism in detail. Good. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Pierre Eric Chamberlain from uh, University of Quebec in Trois Rivières. My uh, question is uh, for the Dr. Haggard again. Um, it is twofold. Uh, the first one is just to validate my understanding, and the second one is a potential uh, research hypothesis. Uh, so, first one sounds as a comment. Uh, isn't it? Ironic that subliminal priming increases the experience of agency, since traditionally priming has been used to influence subjects. I do understand that it is a subjective experience itself that we're talking about, as if the person knew uh, what to do. Or do I confuse the feeling of agency with free will, the doing versus the willing? I think, I think you're right. It's something very ironic. So in one of the slides that I presented this morning, um, we showed that if you ask people uh, how much control do you feel over what happened, we're delivering a completely external stimulus, which is a subliminal prime, and it can actually make, it can bias you in your free choice as to whether to go left or go right, but you feel you have more control. But does so it you really actually have less control but you think you have more. But so does in that it, sense, it's surprising. Does it really bias, or it's just you make the person learn before it, uh, it, actually, it actually does the action? It's like you provide instant learning with subliminal. Well, they don't see the prime. And in, in follow-up tests, we ask them, we show them, that at the end of the experiment, we show them these very briefly flashed primes again. Um, and we say, which way was that? flashy arrow pointing. Was it pointing to the left or was it pointing to the right? And they cannot see. They okay, do not okay. know. So they, they are unaware that they are being externally influenced. Yeah. They are being okay. externally influenced and they think that it's them. So it is, it is, a, I mean, it is an assignment problem. They okay. attribute to, them, to their own 
causation, their own causal power, as something which is in fact done by us. They have less free will, but they think they have more agency. Thus, I, I don't think that the uh, agency versus um, free will is incompatible. Like, even though they willed less, they were still agents yeah. because of the uh, intention, intentional fluency. Okay, so uh, now for my, my second question, which will, which will be short. Uh, in, your in your experiment, uh, concurrently to uh, intentional fluency, did the primed subjects were less exhausted or uh, did they do other tasks after the experiment where they had impeded performance? Or did the uh, not primed subjects felt the experiment was more effortful compared to the prime subjects? Okay, so we didn't ask them that directly, but the, 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 I suppose my assumption would be that intentional fluency feels nice and easy, whereas dealing with asserting your, your volition, your action, in conditions of conflict and uh, countermanding evidence feels difficult and feels exhausting and makes the experiment seem long. So I haven't done that uh, deliberate, I haven't done that specifically with these kinds of studies, but I think the, the literature that's relevant here is um, by Roy Baumeister, who I think is coming soon, right? And um, he has done with his colleagues a number of studies in which effectively people have competing intentions. Um, and there are things, you have to perform a certain number of tasks while resisting the distraction of things like eating cookies, which are placed on the table next to you. And those people find those experiments really long. They dramatically overestimate the, the duration of the experiment. I, I wish uh, we could have a retrospective measure in your design so the people can recall, oh, that experiment was harder than, yeah. So thank you very much for You should do that, thank you. Uh, Eiko Matsuda from Tokyo University. Um, maybe I missed something, but um, categorization is um, to use those categories as symbols. Those categories must be grounded. Uh, so um, acquiring symbols or mental representation, uh, I don't know the difference, but uh, it's quite different from categorization and robots or neural networks can do categorization but cannot, do, um, cannot use symbols. Um, what, is the, what do you think is the necessary mechanism to acquiring symbols? Uh. Well, it's an interesting question. I guess for our purposes, we're, I don't know if what we have learned in our studies using categorization tasks, I don't know if uh, what we have learned really can inf inform us about uh, symbol learning uh, oh. necessarily. I mean, for us, we're really using categorization tasks as a tool for studying visual plasticity. At least that's one way that we think about, about our study and uh, or our, our approach. And the nice thing is that by using well-defined categories with, for example, a category boundary, we can more easily distinguish between regions of the uh, areas of the visual system that uh, represent physical features of stimuli versus the learned fe the, the, the learned or task relevant features, in, in this case, the category. I mean, you can imagine, so we have done some experiments actually where we've trained animals on arbitrary shape associations. Actually, the symbols, the, the shapes were very simple. You could think of them as, as you know, uh, as shapes that are equivalent to symbols that you know that we might use for, for various things, and animals were readily able to learn to associate them with one another, and we saw very similar category-like representations in the very same brain areas in, in uh, lateral and parietal area, for example. And we know that associative learning uh, forms associative neural representations in other parts of the brain, like the inferior temporal cortex and prefrontal cortex. But but these are in you know uh, tasks that are simplified, highly simplified models uh, uh, which are really maybe more useful for understanding neural plasticity and, and how they generalize to more uh, natural decision-making tasks is still unclear, I think, at this point. Thank you. Hi. Uh, 
Yesin uh, University de Montréal. Um, my question f was for Professor Wayne, but uh, he left. Um, I'll, but I will address a question to uh, Professor Arnad. Uh, I want to hear more about um, aplesia and feeling. Because uh, yesterday I was quite convinced that uh, I, I would um, I start to understand what is the heart problem, and I was quite convinced that every creature who senses this environment has a feeling. But uh, Professor Wayne, um, with the talk uh, of Professor, quite convinced me that please I have nothing than input output. So I just want to have more. Opinion or more. <laughs> I'll try to take. I'll take the liberty. My name, oh, Bjorn Brems, Berlin. I'll, I worked in Jack Burns' lab, so I'll take the liberty to to answer the aplysia question in, in the absence of of uh, of Wayne Sasson. Um I don't think he meant explicitly that. Um, Aplesia is only an input-output system because he knows very well that the feeding system um, does show, and he said that there are spontaneously firing neurons uh, also in the aplesia nervous system. And um, I, if, if someone reminds me of it, I did put uh, a video of a spontaneously biting aplesia into my presentation at the end of the very end of it, so I can show that uh, at the end if you want. And so, um, what he was, what he was trying, what, the, the point he was trying to make is that the causality of many of the behaviors, not all of them, but of many of the behaviors are very well known and very well understood. And nowhere is deliberation or, um, or planning or any higher cognitive processes, nowhere, you, they're not there, they're not found. And even in, those, um, even in those where we don't know full, we don't understand the causation of the behavior fully yet, even there, we're so close to an understanding that it's very unlikely that any kind of deliberation is taking place, and that what actually is happening, in, for instance, in the, in the case of um, spontaneous biting behavior, is that there's a, a, an unstable equilibrium. There appears to be an unstable equilibrium, and that um, it's small fluctuations that change this equilibrium into one or the other state in terms of not biting or biting, for instance. And so I think. He was, he was overstating certain things to make a, a very particular point, and I think he did that very well. And then certain details he omitted um, in order to make a very strong case. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sherry Conklin, University of Edinburgh. I'm actually a philosopher. Um, this is for Patrick Haggard. So originally when you uh, presented the experiments, I thought I saw the tension between um, the participants feeling more in control under the circumstances where they were less in control, right, because they had been primed, and feeling less in control under the circumstances where they hadn't been primed. My thought was, you know, now I'm not sure I see that so much, because when we talk about agency, one way of characterizing that is to say reason responsive, and in fact responsive to all of the relevant reasons for acting in a given situation. So in the cases where you're primed, you're giving several pieces of information, um, and when you act in accordance with both pieces of information that are relevant to your acting, then you feel more like an agent. You're in control in that situation because you have acted on all of the information that is presented and this information coheres. Whereas in the other situations, it seems like if you're receiving two different pieces of information, it's harder to make the decision or you might feel conflicted as an agent about what kind of decision that you should be making. And so. Um, you would feel less in control under those circumstances. So I can actually see where that would make sense for agency um, and the way we tend to perceive ourselves rather than the opposite. Um, th thanks, that's a smart question. Um, <laughs> reasons responsiveness is the standard concept um, that's used in philosophy, but it's quite difficult to translate into neuroscience because we don't really know what a reason is. Well, so and in fact, in most of the, um, in most of this sort of tradition of working on um, what's called internally generated action. Right? The, the, the participant is choosing between, let's say, a left and a right key press, and they're, in terms of reasons, they're identical. There, there's no added value to choosing left rather than choosing right. So in some literatures, people would say this isn't choosing, this is just picking. 
right? Okay. So, so that, that point, it's, it's, not <laughs> reason, it's perhaps not reasons responsive in, in the sense that you meant, and some people dislike this work because of that. I think it does involve processes of internal generation of action options, um, which are presumably also available when reasons are present if they are. So for example, I was very struck in your talk, David, that when you deliver the stimulus which is actually on the category boundary, the, there is no right or wrong answer and the animal has to just try and categorize it. And that's functionally exactly equivalent to the way that free will or, or free choice is operationalized in many human action experiments. So I'm not quite sure that I'd say this was really reasons responsive in your sense. In terms of the point that you mentioned, that maybe when, the, when a subliminal prime and a superliminal target are compatible, there's then extra reasons, or there's not quite double reason, because one of the reasons is very thin, it's yeah. subliminal, <laughs> but there's extra reason uh, to, to make a particular choice. That's a, good, that's a good point. I think from the phenomenological point of view, or from the, from the subjective point of view, what's rather interesting is the person doesn't see that prime at all. So the, there's, I'm not sure that I would say the person has that reason at the, in the subjective sense. In other words, um, there's still a process uh, which we can control from the outside, um, uh, and which the person has no particular reason to experience uh, as being additional evidence. Okay. Um, they, they don't know they're being primed. I, I just did want to say that I differ a little bit from most philosophers and that I'm willing to accept a reason is you know, information that's out in the world that we receive okay. that we don't necessarily process in that okay. deliberative, actively conscious sense. Um, I kind of follow okay. Nomi Pelli a little bit in that sense. So I, right, so, so that, there I think you're right, that w when extra information is available in the system, people experience a higher level of agency. I think that, that is perhaps another way of, explain, of stating that result. I think this is a good example of philosophy and science talking to each other. I like this. <laughs> Can I pick up on just one thing there? I mean, wouldn't it be a natural reaction when you found out about the subliminal prime um, not to say, uh, oh yes, that's what I wanted to do, but <laughs> you were manipulating me you know, to be indignant. I mean, supermarkets and marketers do this kind of stuff to us the whole time. And people don't usually regard that when they find out about it as enhancing their freedom. I mean, well, I, I honestly think that um, just because we didn't realize that that reason was present for acting or just because, you know, we didn't necessarily want that reason to be present for acting doesn't mean we didn't successfully act on it. And in general, we want to be able to act on the reasons that are presented to us for acting. So I, I think that. If, if I might uh, chip in, you know, this reminds me of John Searle's uh, demonstration of free will. He gave the messenger lectures at Cornell, a very, very uh, kind of prestigious event. Uh, and his talk on free will started with him demonstrating it by raising his hand. <laughs> Why did he raise his hand? Why was he there? He was there because he was invited because a bunch of people at Cornell wanted to listen to him. So he basically was a slave to the wishes of those people. And the whole thing goes back causally. I mean, you know, his father had a hand in it. His mother had something in it. So there you go. You know, causality is, is, a, is a tough thing. And I find it sometimes funny that people try to explain, say, consciousness in terms of causality, which is tougher in many senses, I think. I may be mistaken, but that, that, that's my And question. related to that, um, I also wanted to say we don't necessarily get to choose our reasons to act on, kind of related to what both of you just said. So just because the reason is present, um, we will often act on it. I don't think that it, it, we have to go, I want this reason and this reason to act on. If the information is there, we often act on it. So that, that's how I think it kind of connects. Francois Richer, you can. The question is mainly for Drs. Uh, Friedman and Haggard. Uh, have you seen slope effects, basically? Uh, Haynes and Chow, a few years ago, found a, a prediction of reaction times, into individual trials of reaction time, uh, through s slopes of activation. And um, that might be linked to uh, conflict resolution, uh, ambiguity resolution. It might be linked to 
confidence in, in decisions, uh, and, and that may vary from region to region. Uh, they were looking at premotor cortex, but did, did you see slope things? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we, uh, in our task, if you think about the directions of motion that are close to the category boundary, uh, th th those are those are more difficult in many cases. The animal's performing at you know 20 percent. Uh, his performance is about 20 percent correct. Uh, 20 percent worse. He's doing about 75 percent correct instead of 95 percent. And if you look at the reaction times when those difficult directions are presented as a, a test stimulus, you do find um, substantially longer reaction times, significantly longer, maybe you know f uh, 40 milliseconds or, or 50 milliseconds or so. Those experiments weren't set up so well to look for reaction time effects since, you know, the animals are mainly classifying that initial stimulus and then remembering that classification for this long delay period. We're actually just uh, initiating some new experiments in the lab now where we set up a reaction time version of the task where the animals can report their decision as, as soon as, it, as they choose. So we'll know more about this soon. But when we do look at slower versus faster reaction time trials, we do see a difference in, in slope. Uh, we do see a more gradual build up to uh, to, uh, to to the, the uh, more more gradual build up in activity on longer reaction time trials, similar to what was seen by uh, by Shaw's group. And, and also with learning, I mean, expertise we, or whatever. We don't know yet. We haven't done the experiments. Hi, uh, Anna from University of British Columbia. I don't have a question, but I have a request to the members of the panel. I, I would like you guys to uh, elaborate on the beautiful role that uh, free will played in human evolutionary history. Free <laughs> <laughs> um, So I, I can tell you what I suppose I um, think, but I'm not quite sure this has anything to do with experimentation. So. Um, humans are social animals and uh, they have relatively flexible behaviors. So um, whereas with an Aplysia, the, the rep repertoire of what they can do is quite limited, the repertoire of what humans can do is quite extensive and evolution is, in, is perhaps the history of the increasing action repertoire. Um, of humans, or human evolution. And that's really good because it, the, the flexibility that your cognitive system gives you allows you to do lots of creative and successful and highly adaptive things. But it's also a real danger because we have to get on together. So there are lots of really things that you could do which become a bit of a problem. So for example, um, my wallet is in my bag just in, in the first row. Now, it really would make a lot of sense for you to take it and run. You know, wh why do you not do so? And I think the point, because our actions are, are mutually set rather unpredictable, we need to have, we've, we have strong social regulation and cultural regulation of what actions are acceptable and what actions are not. And I think once you have flexible, and animals cap capable of producing flexible behaviors, living in social groups, you're probably going to have to have something like responsibility. So responsibility, this is not really a neuroscientific point, but it's, it's perhaps more of an anthropological point. Responsibility seems to be a pretty widespread idea. I don't know if there's anybody here from anthropology, but as far as I can tell, most societies have some sort of concept that people are responsible for the actions that they perform. And I think a, a lot of the lens through which we see the free will problem and the, the, the way that we think about voluntary action is really to do with the fact that there are many possible actions that we each can perform and society needs to keep track of them because if it doesn't, then it's a real danger. We definitely have the illusion of free will, but uh, to, as to the free will itself, it requires uncaused cause, something that is a cause of itself, but it has no prior causes. And that, as Voltaire and Hume showed, 
uh, is an oxymoron. So there's no such thing as free will. And, you, and if you wish, you can continue. If you have the will, you can continue the discussion. We are waiting for you outside. You can continue the discussion. Thank you.